we already looked at this image before when we talked about the differences between qualitative and quantitative and kind of the value behind the context behind that. So if we are a tailor, we might care about the qualitative aspect of the wool. If we're a butcher, we might care about the weight of the sheep um, before it gets butchered because we're looking for different things. The butcher wants to know how much meat so they can sell the meat. The tailor may want the quality of the wool to be high enough that they can make a decent suit out of it. Uh, or dress for that matter. So the context really kind of drives our observations. When we move into chemistry, why is my technology not working with me today? Um, we can make these kind of qualitative observations about the physical and chemical properties. So our physical properties are these observations that we can make on our substances where the identity of that substance doesn't change. So we could feel its phase. If I test that, it, is it a solid or not, uh, that doesn't change its phase to a liquid or a gas. And even then, it doesn't change the chemicals that make it up. So things like phase changes, colors, density, solubility, conductivity, those are all physical properties. They're inherent or intrinsic, I believe is the, the fancy word for it to the substance. Chemical properties are concerned about how the, for lack of a better word, chemical interacts with its environment in a way that changes it inherently. Right? So I believe we talked about our chemical versus physical uh, with respect to say like my body. My clothes are physically connected to me, but my arm Okay, is chemically connected. My clothes could physically come off and it wouldn't change who I am as a person. Okay, I might get a little more embarrassed, but I'm still me. If my arm all of a sudden fell off, that's going to have a pretty drastic change in my environment and everybody's going to freak out probably a whole lot more than if my shirt started coming off. Okay, and so it becomes kind of a, a challenging process to get through. The other thing that I find a little bit weird here is that we talk about them as properties. A physical property is there always. It doesn't, there's not a, a change. It's, it's that same substance. We're just kind of looking at a different aspect of it. A chemical property implies a chemical change already with it. So there isn't really a chemical individual property because it requires you changing it. And if it didn't change, then it was a physical property, not a chemical property. So when we're thinking about chemical versus physical, chemical really fits well with changes. So a chemical change would mean that we're changing the chemical bonds. We talked about Lewis structure. Those bonds, the lines that represent how those atoms are connected, change in a chemical change. In a physical change, those lines don't change. They stay constant. Right? So phase changes are the big example that are physical, not chemical. Okay? To kind of push this point a little bit further, we can look at what our textbook calls as evidence for a chemical reaction. Your textbook splits them out as four things. I reference them as three. So rule one and two to me are the same thing, a change in phase. If you change phase, that is a sign for a chemical reaction. But wait, didn't we say we could take solid ice and turn it into liquid water? That's a, that's a phase change, but that was physical, not chemical. Okay? And this is where that difference between chemical and physical becomes a little bit more challenging. So when we look at this change in phase, uh, what we're looking for is what caused the change in phase. A change in phase requires an energy transfer, re the last uh, item on this list. If I take solid ice and I add heat to it to cause the phase change, well, that's physical. I'm physically causing it to change phases. If instead I take a solid and I put it into a liquid solution and I see a gas, where did the energy come from 
to cause the solid to go to a gas. Oh, that's a chemical change. If that energy is being supplied by the chemicals, we're looking at a chemical change. If it's being supplied by you, that's a physical change. Okay? So we can see that with gas formation. We're adding, it's kind of hard to see in that image, but there's a little curly Q thing in there. That's a solid being mixed with a liquid, and we're seeing this gas form. Okay? That gas is due to a chemical reaction between the solid and the liquid, making a new chemical. Okay? Chemical change. Um, a solid forming. Okay? If we take two clear liquids, so we see the dropper going into this is a clear liquid, and then the bulk of that solution is a clear liquid. When I mix those two, I see this yellow solid. Okay? That's, and how do I know it's a solid? Well, the light's not passing through the sample. It's no longer clear. So I have a solid being formed. This is often referred to as a precipitate, also characteristic for uh, a chemical reaction. Permanent color change, okay? It's yellow now. That's a permanent color change. I do have to be careful that it's not a dilution in color, and that one is challenging because I could take food coloring and add it to frosting. Okay, I buy white frosting, or I make white frosting, and I add red food coloring to it. Now that white frosting has permanently become red. Well, technically, it's not permanent, and that's a, that's a real weird one. I'll try and find a video to link out to it, but actually, that's reversible. You could just stir the exact opposite direction, and it will go back to white cake frosting. Who knew? Yeah. So that's a physical change because it's not a permanent change. Okay. But I can't separate those two liquids to get the color back in this case. Okay. And then the last one is an energy change. If I see energy somehow being exchanged, sometimes I can see that in the phase change because transition from a solid to a liquid to a gas, we have to add energy in so that our particles move more. Um, other times we won't see that phase change, but if we were holding on to the reaction, we would feel it get really, really, really hot, okay, or really, really, really cold, okay. That's a change in energy. It just wasn't associated with a big phase change, okay. Um, so the release, if you were touching it and it got hot, you're now looking at what's known as an exothermic reaction. Exo for outside, think exoskeleton, so insects have a skeleton on their outside, okay, exothermic, outside heat. Heat is going outside. That's exothermic, okay? If we absorb that heat, that's now endothermic or inside heat. The heat's traveling into the reaction. So if a reaction absorbs heat, everything that we would feel on the outside is going to be cold because all the heat is moving into the reaction away from our hand. Light, as we'll see in a video at some point, and I'm not sure the order that that will show up, uh, is also a form of energy. And so light emission also counts. Okay, so we could see this is a light emission. You're seeing a flame there. That's probably also due to a release of heat. Okay. So now we've got kind of some questions that we should think about as far as chemical and physical goes. And yes, these are intended to be a bit misleading, and there's a little bit of a hint as to what I'm getting at with this, with the rainbow up there. If you remember all the way back to our continuous versus discrete discussion of atomic structure. So we've got six things here. Uh, pause the video, take a second, and label them out as chemical or physical, and see what you come up with. Yeah, that meant space bar. And now I'm going to assume you've got it nailed down. That's a stupid looking face. Let's fix that. Because that's better. Um, <clears throat> let's go through and, and work through this together. Okay, so melting ice. That's going from a solid to a liquid. Okay, that doesn't change the inherent property. That's physical. Okay, it's still water. I could reverse that process. Dissolving sugar. Okay, I take sugar and I add it to water. So solid sugar, liquid water, it just looks like a clear liquid at the end, okay? So we might call that physical, and that's a pretty good statement. 
burning wood. Okay, this is one of the reasons why I actually dislike how these are, are referenced here, um, because burning wood is taking an organic substance, CH4, plus O2, that's burning, to make CO2 plus H2O. When I write it out in that format, you're probably screaming, well, duh, that's chemical. Yeah. Yeah, that is. But the English language doesn't necessarily hint that that's what's going on. Dissolving salt. Okay. Salt, white, solid. Water, clear liquid. I mix the salt with the water, and I get a clear liquid. So that would obviously be chemical. No recording issue there. Isn't that the same as dissolving sugar? We said sugar was physical. Why is dissolving salt chemical? This is one of the problems that I have with differentiating chemical versus physical. Okay. We have to know something about what is happening in that process. When we take dissolving sugar... We take H2O, we mix it with sugar, C6H12O6, and we get the exact same thing. If we take salt with H2O, I don't get just NaCl, I get sodium ion and chloride ion. Well, what's the di big difference here? We're talking about a covalent compound versus an ionic compound. And that changes how those substances interact with a solvent, like water. And dissolving salt, we're breaking the ionic bond. And by breaking that ionic bond, we've now chemically altered it. That's a chemical change, not a physical. Even though the dissolving of salt is probably more reversible than the dissolving of sugar, okay? So that concept of reversibility doesn't really hold. So we really have to have a solid understanding of what's happening at that chemical level. And that is why I find these kind of questions to be a bit challenging. Irreversible, sorry. And even the, the words of reversible and irreversible is they aren't perfect. Okay. You might also notice that as we went through with those first four, that I did use different colors to represent each. And that's not just because those different colors, I'm trying to show different questions. I'm trying to highlight the fact that what we're looking at here is a continuum. When we're looking at chemical versus physical, it's not chemical or physical. It's anywhere from chemical at one extreme and physical at the other extreme. And some of them are more black and white than others. For instance, melting ice is very physical. Drawing red over red was a really dumb idea. Let's try that again. Okay. And dissolving sugar is very physical. Okay. Burning of wood is very chemical. Dissolving of salt depending on your content knowledge of where that placement should go, becomes very questionable in deciding if you should call that chemical or physical. Okay? And so it's following the absolute definitions. Okay? One of the questions that usually pops up here is, well, what the hell should I remember as a student? I know. Okay? Um, so the examples that I pick are to pick the largest contrasts between chemical and physical. So if I'm going to test you, I'm testing you on things that are very clearly chemical or that are very clearly physical. And that can be a challenging line to define, but that is something that I try to do when writing a, a, a test exam question. Okay. Continuing on, mixing red food dye with white cake frosting. This ends up being a physical. This is probably verging on that orange-yellow, because we think about that reversibility. It is technically reversible, it's just not easy to see. Um, but that's a pretty solid physical change. The last one is kind of a, 
concept that's kind of near and dear to me because I think it's fun and I did a little bit of research on it in grad school. Um, what's happening in these images is we're starting with a yellow crystal. That yellow crystal has ultraviolet light aimed at it. That ultraviolet light now makes the crystal turn purple. Okay, so we're seeing a color change. What makes this one extra interesting is when we get rid of that ultraviolet light, the reaction goes back or the, the color reverts back to a yellow crystal. This is known as a photochromic molecule. And if you've ever seen those fancy sunglasses that change color in sunlight, it's this exact process. You're taking a chemical embedded in that glass and when it gets exposed to UV light outside, it changes to a darker color. When you go inside, there's no more UV light and the molecule reverts back and we lose that color. Without actually knowing what's happening at that chemical level, we've got a reversible process. We might push this towards a physical. But if you drill down deep into the understanding of the chemical, you are actually making and breaking chemical bonds with the presence of UV light. Okay, because you're breaking bonds, that is a chemical reaction. But again, depending on what you know or can see, observe of that, your answer drastically changes. Okay, so what I want you to be aware of is this placement of chemical and physical can be challenging. It probably requires a little bit of digging in research to look at. Use your textbook to give you an idea of, of quote unquote easy comparisons that are really starkly chemical or physical, um, but realize even then there is some variability within it. Okay, The big thing that I want you to get out of it would be coming back to our what is the, the evidence for a chemical reaction. And when we start looking at our actual chemical reactions, we're going to make a reference to these kind of bullets. Okay, With that, I'm pretty sure we're done. Yep. Uh, so hopefully that wasn't too insanely frustrating, and I'm going to attempt to stop our video now.